Hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all our viewers tuning in from all across the globe today. Also, a very warm welcome to our dear panelists. My name is Deepak Mahapatra, and I am working as the ARE. I'm, I'm working at the, at the Alliance for Rural Electrification as the Policy and Business Development Officer. Today, I'm standing in for um, on behalf of Mr. David Lecoq, who is our CEO, who is unfortunately not present with us because of some other urgency. First of all, I would like to uh, extend our vote of thanks to the European and African Union, as well as the government of Portugal for hosting this very important event and honoring us with the opportunity to be a part of it. Also, many thanks to the technical team and everyone involved for ensuring the smooth proceedings of the event. So today we have all gathered to mark the opening of very important initiative brought to you by Gruner Berger Energy and the Alliance for Rural Electrification, titled Paving the Way for Clean Energy Transition with Decentralized Renewable Energy Series. This is going to be a series of 10 important events with different topics under the subject of clean energy transition. The events are planned to occur in every quarter from now on, with today's session being the opening event of the series. The prime objective of this PWCET series is to promote public discourse on the subject of the clean energy transition with decentralized renewable energy in sub-Saharan Africa, which is the focus topic of Gruner Burger Energy. So without any further ado, I would like to hand over the floor to Mrs. Dorothea Otremba, Senior Advisor GIZ, to carry on with the proceedings and wish you all a very informative session. Thank you, and the floor is all yours, Mrs. Otremba. Yeah, thank you very much, Deepak, for your introduction. Also from my side, I'd like to welcome all of you. For me, it's a great pleasure to moderate this session. Uh, before we start and go into the topic, let me briefly outline the proceedings of the session. We will start with a keynote speak, followed by three presentations. Then we continue to a day bud with our panelists. Afterwards, we move to a question and answer part. We try to be as interactive as possible. And therefore, um, you can also ask questions via chat. You can post your questions throughout the session, which will then feed in, into um, our question and answer part after the debate. Now, i like to welcome Mrs. Bärbel Höhn, she is a special representative for energy in Africa of the Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, BMZ. We appreciate that Mrs. Hearn is with us today, giving the keynote speech and joining the panel as well. So maybe the next slide. Mrs. Babel Hearn is former Minister of State from 1995 to 2005 member of German Bundestag from 2005 to 2017, and since 2018, Chair of Global Renewable Congress. Mrs. Sohn has extensive expertise and experiences in the field of energy, climate, agriculture, and environment. She has contributed both her extensive expertise in the energy sector, as well as her political experiences and networks to the implementation of the Green People's Energy. Mrs. Hearn, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mrs. Otremba. And next slide, please. Yes, it's a great pleasure to speak to all of you because these issues are very, very important, not only for Africa, but also for Africa, because we are talking about the climate crisis and the impact of climate crisis is very much in, in Africa. So we see extreme weather, we see floods, we see heatings um, that are really great. We see droughts and um, we see storms and all this um, extreme weather altogether destroys the harvest. Um, we have many people have not enough water, they have not enough to, uh, to eat and the, the animals have not enough um, feed. And um, therefore, it's so important that we will not um, will not ex exceed the 1.5 uh, degrees goal from Paris Agreement. 
Um, and because it's important not only for Africa, it's important for all of us. So industrial countries have to reduce the CO2 emissions. But very important is um, the main driver of climate change is the energy sector. So 73% uh, of the emissions are coming from electricity, from heating and cooling systems and transport. On the other side, uh, Africa needs energy because with no energy, we will not um, overcome hunger, we will not overcome uh, poverty, we, uh, we have with energy better uh, health systems and a better education system and, uh, for example, a better water situation. So, especially in rural areas, uh, we need to build up um, electricity and even look for a better situation for clean cooking because 600 million people in Sub-Saharan Africa have no or lack access to electricity or to energy and 90% of them living in rural areas. But you can't install big power plants and uh, national grid. You have to look for other, for more modern, for digital solutions and that are mini grids that, that are decentralized renewable energies to help the people there and um, to give them a better living conditions. We see now with the COVID-19 pandemic that we have the risk of failing behind. But even in this moment, we see that decentralized renewable energies can help in the situation to overcome the crisis. Next slide, please. Yeah, and um, so we, we would like um, to work together from the EU and uh, with Africa um, to, um, to finish the green cover, uh, recovery. Uh, Mr. Um, uh, Franz Timmermans told from all the programs from the EU Commission on Friday, and we would like to deepen the partnership between the EU and Africa. Uh, we have some climate and energy cooperation with Africa, and even that we would like to support the rural areas of Africa, uh, because we see that we have um, a lot of, of people living there, they have no perspectives, they are going to the cities and makes the problems there bigger. So to achieve the 2030 agenda, we have to do something to invest in rural areas. And the EU started the um, uh, Green Energy Initiative, the EU Commission, uh, to deepen uh, the partnerships between Africa and EU and to look for more ambitious innovation packages in this part of Africa. Um, and I would like to tell you something about the German initiatives. We have two initiatives started in the last years. One is the Green People's Energy for Africa and the other, the energy self-sufficient villages. And I think you know NDEF. NDEF is a multi-donor program and helps a clean cooking situation to make it better and even a small solar home systems and some examples of mini grids. And now we try with this green people's energy, we try for more um, initiatives because we have to scale up. Um, it's not only the time for some examples and some villages, but it's the time to scale up and that more and more uh, people can participate of this new technologies. And even in this um, pandemic, we can see that it's easier to help the people with uh, renewable energies, with decentralized solutions than with central solutions. Please, next slide. Yeah, what's about Green People's Energy for Africa? That is an initiative of um, Minister Müller, the Minister of Economic Cooperation and Development in, in Germany. And what we are doing is that we would like to support renewable energies in Sub-Saharan Africa. And as I said, especially in rural areas. Um, so we must um, work together with small and media-sized um, companies uh, because we would like to strengthen the, the local market. We would like to create jobs. We would like um, to, uh, for example, make productive use with uh, this decentralized energies to cool um, the fish or, um, for example, to dry the fruits. 
and have more income and have more jobs and more perspective in these uh, villages. Um, so we have to work together with a local level, um, municipalities, but also cooperatives or public associations and civil societies, um, because the actors of this program uh, we will find on the local level, and they must take more responsibility that this project can be successful. And, and what we want uh, to achieve is that there is a common benefit um, across the country, that the people um, learn, yes, our, uh, our conditions are better uh, now, and it's a good benefit um, to have more renewables, have more energy, or have a better cooking situation. Um, and especially we would like to encourage women because we know that we need them to be successful in Africa. Next slide, please. Yes, why we are looking for renewables um, and what is the advantage of decentralized renew renewable energies? Um, renewable energies are cheaper as, for example, coal, fire plants um, or uh, big national, solution, uh, national solutions, um, big grids. Um, so you are maybe in a better situation than we were 100 years ago because we can now install modern technology, decentralized uh, solutions and digital solutions. Um, and photovoltaic is now very, very cheap. We can uh, install these solutions faster because with big solutions we need a lot of months and maybe some years um, to be successful, we can do it faster with renewables. And they are more flexible because we can look in different uh, villages, maybe in one uh, photovoltaic is interesting, another wind turbine, and the other um, small hydro. Uh, so we have a lot of solutions to help the people in the different villages. And we can create more jobs in Germany when we were focusing on renewable energies, we created 10 times more jobs than when we invested the money in big power plants. So uh, there's more perspective for the young people, even in rural areas. And this um, decentralized renewable energies are more independent uh, because you don't have to pay for the sun and the wind. But for example, if you have no coal in your country, you have to pay for import of coal, or you must dig it uh, in your country and have costs. Uh, so it's better to use um, the, the wind and the sun than fossil uh, fuels. And as I said, it's very important that women have a benefit of it. Um, so for example, when I talked with um, solar home companies, they said they make their contracts with women because and uh, they can trust them more that they will pay the money back um, for the investment of the solar home systems. And this woman, they have um, they have some small income because they have not only a light or a TV, but they have also a charging system and can charge the cell phones of the neighbors and have some income and maybe um, put this money back for the education of their children. At the end, it's climate friendly. As I said, we have the climate um, change and it's coming worse. And, and so it's better to install climate friendly technology than uh, fossil fuels. And as I said, there must be a benefit for the local development, a better situation for them, and we can um, manage that with uh, energy. So two thirds of the 17 sustainable development goals, we can reach better when we are investing in energy. And that's what we are doing. Next slide, please. Yes, what is the experience from Germany? Um, you can't transfer the technology from Germany to Africa because it's so different and the situation uh, you, you can't compare. But maybe there are some ideas um, we can use. One of the main points in Germany was that we made a coalition, a cross-political party coalition. So some parliamentarians from all parties came together to support renewables. And that was um, 
um, basic of the success in Germany. In the last year, uh, 2020, we produced our electricity, uh, more than 50% of our electricity was coming, was produced from renewable energies. Um, and um, that's really great because we are a big industrial country and uh, we need a lot of electricity and more than 50%, more than the half of our, our electricity is now coming from solar, from wind, from biomass uh, on, and from hydro, but also but only very, very small part from hydro. Most time is wind and solar. And that's really a great success. Um, but you can also learn from our mistakes because um, the sector coupling, we made a lot of mistakes. We first thought um, we have to um, substitute um, energy production, but we also have to look not only for producing electricity, but also for the um, transport sector, for the heating and cooling systems and combine all together. Uh, when we combine it all together, we can be more efficient and look for better solutions um, and use the electricity better when we are looking for all sectors. Um, and as I said, it's very important to empower the local population. So for example, in Germany, we have 1.5 million um, people in Germany who are prosumer. They are producing electricity and they are consuming e electricity. I am one of them. So on my house, on, on the roof, there is a solar system and I pro I'm producing my own electricity. Give some to the grid and the other I use for myself. Um, and uh, so we um, put the production of electricity in the hand of the population. And that's, that was really great. And that was the support of our energy transition in Germany. Yes, we have something like energy cooperatives. Um, I was minister in charge of environment and agriculture. And so, you know, a lot of agriculture uh, cooperatives because one farmer has not the, the, um, is not so strong like a cooperative of, um, of farmers. And so not only in Germany, but also in Africa, we have a lot of rural um, agriculture cooperatives. And in Germany, we added energy to that. So we have energy cooperatives that are uh, people in a village or in the region uh, all together um, make a cooperative and they are all together producing electricity. Um, maybe that can be a model for, for Africa because in Germany, we had a lot of success with that. Next slide, please. Yes, and what do we need to be successful? Um, I made a lot of travels and trips to Africa and had a lot of talks and saw a lot of situations. And the main point is um, that we need a political will. Um, because often I saw that the regulation is not um, not the best one for investing in renewables. For example, the tariff system was not good and, and other barriers are there. In some parts of Africa, it's better than in others. Um, that is one point uh, that we must uh, focus on. And the other is we need private capital because we don't have enough capital. We need more capital. And if you want to uh, to uh, have more private capital, um, we give we must give the investors the security uh, for their private capital, and that is a very very important point um, to do with that. For example, if they are investing in uh, mini grids, um, and uh, the national plans are to bring the national grid there, and then tell the people you can take the electricity on the national grid uh, that is a splendid investment for the private capital so we have to look what are really as um, regions where the national grid when to come there and then you can invest in private capital and have the guarantee that you get your money back in maybe the next 10 years and we must strengthen the uh, domestic market because we would like to create new jobs. We would like to strengthen um, the do domestic uh, companies. Um, that is uh, very important to strengthen the economy in the different countries of Africa. The second very important point is a sustainable solution. 
When I'm coming to Africa, see now um, invested capital, no good solutions, uh, and I'm coming back again in 10 years, um, I would see that this uh, solutions must work um, and not we invest in, in a mini grid and uh, two years later, there's uh, maybe a small component doesn't work any longer and then the whole system is failing. Um, so we need sustainable solutions that are working in 10 or 15 years like they are doing now. And that means we need quality standards. We must train the people and motivate the local people that they can take some responsibility to take care of um, the mini grids. And we need sustainable operator models um, to um, look for the future and um, Maybe good maintenance is very, very important. And the uh, third point is um, funding model. So we need a good financing instruments. Um, so we, we, I'm doing, I, we have some ideas with the KFW that they are investing in the future in small projects and not only in big projects. Because that was in the past, it's easier for a, for a bank to invest in one big project than maybe in 100 small projects. And so we are looking for some possibilities to invest in small projects, uh, result-based financing, or support crowdfunding and tender models. Uh, that's all we are doing. So we have a lot of ideas to support renewables and I think we have to do it. We must be successful and we can su be successful, but we have to start. And that's what we would like to, to tell you. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. Next slide, please. Yeah, thank you very much, Ms. Sun, uh, for your inspiring keynote speech and sharing your broad knowledge and uh, experiences with us. Uh, we are looking forward to having you on the panel later. Thanks again, Mrs. Sun. Now we are looking forward to the presentation of uh, Mr. Jens Jäger. Mr. Jäger is a policy and business development manager at the Alliance for Rural Electrification. So please, Jens, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dorothea. And, um Thank you also to Mrs. Sern for a, an extremely insightful uh, keynote speech. I think there are a lot of uh, elements in there that we would agree uh, on in the in ARE, if not uh, all of them. Uh, in particular, um, I'd like to reiterate what you said about uh, decentralized renewables playing a key role in the COVID uh, pandemic uh, recovery. Um, obviously, in ARE, we agree on this. Um, and this is also part of why we have this a joint series on paving the way for the clean energy transition with decentralized uh, renewable energies together uh, as TBE and ARM. Um, so the, the background of that is also that um, several independent assessments recently have shown that uh, decentralized renewables are the cheapest electrification option for the majority of connections by uh, 2030 in emerging markets. So the message um, I would like to convey today is, well, decentralized renewables is not a niche market. It actually should be the mainstream market, the bigger market in, in, uh, in um, emerging, emerging countries rather than uh, grid electrification. So I think we're going to see that um, shift towards decentralization in, in the coming years. Um, if we go to the next slide, um, I'm just, I can just quickly explain uh, where ARE sees itself in this picture. Uh, so we are the uh, International Business Association for uh, companies, so the private sector active in decentralized renewable en uh, energies. Uh, our mission is to uh, activate markets for affordable and reliable energy services and creating local jobs and inclusive economies. So to reiterate again what uh, Ms. Sun said, um, decentralized renewables can provide a reliable, uh, long-term sustainable electricity service, uh, also a future-proof uh, service in the sense that, um, let's say that decentralized renewables is a great way to mitigate and adapt to climate change. 
Uh, it's also a tremendous catalyst of job creation uh, and socioeconomic development if done correctly, and especially if if done by local businesses. Um, this is particularly because the labor is in the communities themselves uh, if you train uh, local operators, local installers, and local system designers. Um, so about ARE, we, uh, as I said, we're the, the biggest um, industry association in, in this space. We unite about 175 members, uh, maybe even a little bit more at this time. And our members are active worldwide, primarily in Africa, uh, Asia Pacific, and Latin America and the Caribbean. If we move to the next slide, uh, we can just quickly see the distribution of our members. I won't, of course, read them all out. That would take quite quite a while. Um, but this just shows the, um, let's say, diversity of the members, uh, including large utilities, such as Andy, you'll hear from in a moment, and uh, smaller companies as well, such as Access from Mali, who you will also hear from in just a moment. Next slide, please. In terms of our regional focus, 86% um, of our members are active in Africa. So that remains our core focus. Um, about half of our members are also active in Asia Pacific and 39% in Latin America. Of course, um, for the astute observer, you'll see that this uh, amounts to more than 100%, but that's uh, obviously because several companies can be active in, in several continents at once. We're also technology agnostic, meaning that we promote all decentralized renewables, including uh, solar, hydro, uh, wind, and so on. Next slide, please. So what, what does ARE do to, um, to catalyze this decentralized renewable energy market? Well, first and foremost, we work um, to support our members with market intelligence, business development, uh, policy, and communication support. Uh, within the market intelligence and business development support, we are happy to um, also be working on a publication right now with the Green People's Energy Initiative. Um, so t stay tuned on more information about that. It will be on community-driven uh, decentralized renewable energy projects with lessons learned from both Africa and uh, Europe, or well, especially Germany. Uh, and we're also working on a number of uh, other activities, such as uh, webinars. On the policy and advocacy front, we uh, work closely together with uh, governments and uh, international organizations. Uh, one particular example of a recent initiative is our Clean Energy Mini-Grid uh, Policy Development Guide. I can perhaps touch more on that in the discussion. And on the communication and marketing front, we uh, provide our members with visibility uh, in the sector. Next slide, please. So uh, on the topic of the day on successful partnerships, um, we have, so obviously given that we have, uh, have experiences since 2006 with ARE, quite a number of uh, successful partnerships. Um, one particularly um, successful example is with Get Invest, which has been over um, the last many years organizing um, various uh, investment mobilization activities in the sector. We also now have a, an extremely successful partnership with uh, the Green People's Energy in Initiative, of course, um, recently started. And um, another one is with UNIDO on the before mentioned uh, clean energy policy, uh, clean energy mini grid policy development guide. But that's just to name a few. Um, we have a full, let's say, a large plethora of of successful partnerships. Next slide, please. So um, specifically about the COVID uh, mitigation uh, measures we have taken in ARE, I'd just like to highlight what we did in that regard. Um, so first of all, when the crisis um, came upon us, we realized the uh, necessity to support companies with both uh, financial and uh, technical and regulatory support. What we did almost immediately after the crisis broke out was to um, have consultations with our members on what should be the industry uh, position on this, uh, what is our ask. Um, and so we developed a call to action 
uh, which included uh, included a roadmap for the sector, asking for um, relief funds. It also asked for technical assistance, a uh, call uh, to recognize DRE as an essential service, and more. And we are happy to note that a large part of these um, suggestions have been implemented. For example, uh, technical assistance windows from funders. Uh, we've also seen the launch of the EFDB um, off-grid relief initiative, the Energy Access Relief Fund, uh, and more. We've co-organized a an Energy Access COVID-19 relief summit with Google. Um, and a few and get invest and other partners um, and a number of other initiatives. So there has been a tremendous, um, let's say, resilience actually from the decentralized renewable energy sector in the response to COVID-19. Um, while it has been impacted, we were expecting worse. Uh, we were expecting uh, to see a multitude of companies going uh, bankrupt. To be honest, based on the initial investigations, but but in, in reality, we've actually seen, uh, while some companies are struggling, that we have seen our membership increase in ARE, uh, which, is, which is quite significant, I think, despite the pandemic. Um, so overall, um, the DRE uh, sector is used to adversary or um, adversary, so uh, used to facing uh, challenging conditions, and maybe that's also part of why we've seen it be quite resistant to this crisis. If we can move to the next slide, I'd also, uh, obviously within the uh, COVID-19 relief campaign, we also propose solutions for the green recovery after the pandemic. Um, I think here there were elements of Mrs. Sun's speech, which also echo in what we want to do in ERE. Um, what we are proposing in the green recovery is um, a series of market development programs um, on the country level, as well as uh, overall facilitation activities such as uh, events, um, publications, market intelligence on the international level. Now on the uh, national level, um, a few of the elements that I'd like to reiterate from the previous intervention was the promotion of local um, micro and small enterprises. That's also something we we are extremely um, supportive of in ARE, uh, and we would like to do more in that regard. So far, we've organized uh, investment academies, for example, or, or we are organizing investment acad academies at present for, for SMEs. We've also organized um, master classes for our members um, but we'd like to do even more in that regard. Another element is um, the element of technical capacity building, which we would also, uh, which we are also going to do more on in the coming months. Uh, so, with that little teaser on the uh, re green recovery country program, I think um, I'm running out of time, so I can perhaps uh, go more into detail on the specifics in the discussion. So thank you for the opportunity. If anyone is um, interested in working with ARE on these initiatives, feel free to contact me and um, uh, we can speak anytime. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much, Jens. This was very interesting and inspiring. And uh, we are really looking and we are exciting to read the new publication of the um, political tools you just published. And... Um, yeah, and using also the tools accordingly. And surely Ara will receive feedback on this. So thank you very much, Jens. So our next speaker is Mr. Ibrahim Chogola. So thank you for your participating in this session, uh, Ibrahim. Mr. Chogola is the chairman and co-founder of Access SA, and he is connecting from Mali. So please, Ibrahim, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dorota. And uh, I'm very honored. I would like to thank uh, the Green People Energy and also the IRA, who is our member. Uh, you know, we are a member of IRA for many years now. And uh, congratulating them for the great work they are doing. So 
is a is a really a good honor to to take a floor on this important uh, event on uh, having the way for clean energy transition with a decentralized renewable energy. And it was also really great to hear the Babel Horn, who is uh, one of our main ambassador for promotion of renewable energy and entrepreneurship approach in Africa. You know, uh, thank you, Babel, for it's a great and very kind work, and thank for your engagement. These. Next, please. Uh, yeah, so I think, uh, sure, we all know about that. So, without uh, important investment, it's very also impossible to really find a solution to the uh, challenges that Africa is facing, especially in the energy sectors. So, we have, uh, in, when we talk about West Africa, we have about uh, almost 350 million people. And, uh, and we are one of the lowest uh, in terms of access to energy. And my country, Mali, is uh, also among the lowest because uh, if we are in the rural areas, home of almost 70% of our population and uh, less than 19% of the rural communities have access to energy. So if you take this in uh, general terms, we can say that uh, we have uh, about, um, you know, uh, 12,000 villages in Mali and uh, today we have less than uh, 600 villages which are electrified. So in terms of really concrete, we can show you the, the what has to be still done. And in a similar situation in almost all the Sahel countries, Burkina Faso, Niger, and so on. Uh, so, and therefore, you know, we, we have, but that is not only an investment aspect, it's also a kind of, uh, I think Babi mentioned his uh, uh, presentation, he did not speak. We have also kind of uh, uh, enabling environments, you know, which are really essential here. So we, in addition to, you know, you have a kind of financial aspect, affordability. So even if renewable are getting cheaper and cheaper, we have to say that initial investment, you know, with our banking systems, you know, is uh, still uh, some challenge for entrepreneurs. So therefore, most of our population are still on uh, biomass, as you all know. And then we have also a very important dimension is about uh, vocational training, lack of capacity, so have qualified people. Therefore, I think it's very good to say here that uh, Green People Energy with the Mali Fall Center and, uh, you know, AJZ is working for a very important program, renewable energy and agriculture in Mali. So this is to really try to solve some of those capacity, you know, when it comes to the access to, to, to energy. Then we have more and more, of course, the climate change is there, but we have also the new challenges coming to really make things uh, more complicated is about the security issues in the Sahel, you know, that we have uh, many areas in our countries today and the neighboring countries where the work is becoming more and more challenging to, to provide uh, energy services. But the solution on that I will talk about during my presentation. Next, please. So uh, there's, a, there's a measure we, we, you know, we have to say when we are talking about paving the way, so one of the important issues is, the, you know, the implication of the political side and institutional, uh, you know, dynamic to access to energy. So there are some initiatives. I think uh, we have to say that lately, the last uh, 20, 15 years, 15, 20 years, there have been a lot of work at the policy, uh, policy levels. So Mali, among all the countries in West Africa, established uh, uh, rural electrification agencies, which is very important. Mali, Senegal, Niger, Benin, Burkina Faso, etc. So we, even our economy are very uh, small. Uh, the big effort has been done uh, para, uh, regarding the tax exemptions. So most of those countries, uh, Mali for almost uh, 15 years now, they are duty for duty uh, uh, exemptions on entrance. So all renewable energy equipment don't pay any taxes when they are coming in, you know, entrance in a country. So this is very important because you remove about almost 30% of course, you know, we have uh, both national and international private sector are present. And uh, many NGOs are also working on, uh, like I mentioned, on the Mali Forest Center with uh, uh, GZ uh, on uh, uh, trainings and vocational trainings. And then we have also the more and more focus on renewable energy and uh, uh, agriculture. So we have uh, 
uh, German uh, initiatives on uh, innovative green centers. And then we uh, today we have a digitalization system. It allows us to deliver that more. You can more work more on remote area with the smart meters and digitalize all your payment and so on, which makes a lot of possibilities. Yeah, and also the the different trading. Next, please. So uh, my company uh, Access is a, a dynamic, very dynamic company. Twelve years experience. I think we are today uh, uh, largest uh, mini grid operators in Mali, and uh, with uh, 24 uh, mini grids uh, across the country. And uh, we are uh, very young, uh, dynamic technician and engineers. Uh, we have our own in-house uh, development project development. We are developing projects. We are doing all the engineering, procurement, construction. We also provide uh, EPC services to others, uh, you know, uh, international organizations. I will tell you about that later. We made our own uh, operation and maintenance, uh, distribute, we build a grid, design, build our own grid, both low voltage and more, uh, medium voltage. We also do the solar kiosks, uh, solar home systems, and people systems, solar rooftop systems. And uh, we are doing uh, uh, integrated management systems and providing training to our own people and also to other mini grid operators as well. So that is really some of the work we are doing today in uh, after 12 years experience on account in Mali. Next slide. Yeah. So we, it means we. Today, uh, the capacity on the villages uh, is very uh, is different of the size because, as I told you, uh, there is a lot of work to do. So the village are from anything from uh, 3,000 people to 20,000 people. That means the capacity installed go from 33 kilowatts uh, to up to 200 kilowatts. Now we are even some villages. Uh, by next year, we are some of our villages are going to move first time in 1.2 megawatts uh, solar because of the demand. And um, so there's a, we have today about, uh, in total, uh, about 10 megawatts uh, that we, we installed. And uh, this year had been, uh, the last two years, 2019 and uh, 2020, had been very busy for us because we, uh, by uh, June, we'll have uh, about 21 mini grids to be connected, new mini grids to be connected on a grid. Uh, five uh, uh, funded by EMOA, uh, which is a monetary union, six by the World Bank, and also the Abu Dhabi Development Fund. So it's been, yes, we had a pandemic, uh, COVID, but it's been quite regular, uh, less of that, been quite busy year for us and many other companies in Africa uh, when it comes to energy access, you know, that's been quite a, a active year, you know, and very dynamic years uh, for, for all of us. The continent. The next is yeah, that's a bit uh, some of our work on the ground. Uh, you know, many you know you are making site visits uh, to make uh, feasibility, environmental impact assessment, licensing, uh, consumption forecast, and so on. Uh, what is need to say here? All Africa that made of your consumption, but uh, after the system, maximum in one, one and a half years, uh, we have to double the, uh, you know, the capacity and uh, because of the, of the booming, someone sent, children send their refrigerators, some of the workshops and all those things. So it's really uh, big energy demand. You can see that you size a village for 50 kilowatts, but then you will be, get uh, to 200 kilowatts in less than one and a half two years uh, period. So we we are working with the uh, leading role, so young companies and uh, our solar panel are coming from um, from 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 China. That uh, all the was electronics coming from Germany when it comes to battery and uh, different accessories. So and um, then we 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 have a very good team on uh, installing the power side and us. To the great side, in uh, the distribution 
then uh, we have a very thanks for the maintenance is because our fund are many by three people now that uh, many would say we get more and more now Um, uh, Ibrahim, uh, sorry if I interrupt you, but your internet connection yes. is getting bad. So, yes. you can you? Uh, okay. Uh, I think we lost you. Ibrahim, you are still with us? Okay. Okay. So um then thank you very much um Mr Togola um the contribution reflects a wide range of experiences and will we certainly okay. return yeah. to one or the other aspects again in our discussion after the presentation so um yeah Ibrahim, we will switch to the next um to the next presentation and afterwards we are coming back okay. in our panel discussion to some of your um aspects in your presentation. Uh, so uh, I like to invite Mrs. Mukabani Matanuka to give her presentation. Uh, we are very happy um, we are very happy um, to have you here today and uh, Mrs. Matanuka is head of Minigrids uh, at NG uh, Energy Access Zambia and she is connected from Zambia. So please, uh, Mrs. Matanuka, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Dorothea, and uh, for the organizers of the conference for extending an invitation to ONGI to actually participate in a very high-level discussion such as this one, which is also very pertinent and important. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so on this uh, slide, I'm showing you a global overview of um, the NG. Uh, energy access, which is an integrated uh, solution that uh, positions NG as a market leader in terms of the provision of um, uh, affordable pay-as-you-go solar home system solutions, as well as uh, smart mini grid uh, solutions that actually incentivize and accelerate uh, productive usages. Next slide, please. So um, this slide actually narrows down to one solution, which is uh, the mini grid solution that is actually premised around uh, a green asset based solution with uh, a modular generation unit, as you can see there, uh, that has uh, PV and battery storage and also a distribution network that is channeled through a smart cloud based uh, digital platform, which easily integrates with uh, payment platforms to make our operational reliability of top class and also to be able to provide real-time data and very good customer service. So um, you notice there that um, within the presentation, the focus of uh, NG Mini Grids is really to uh, unlock the productive uh, and economic potential of uh, rural areas. And of course, this we facilitate through uh, incentivizing productive usages and IGA activities. Um, this is a key component aside from our electricity provision that is centered around our business development and also commercial units that actually sit to see how our customers evolve from being a tier one kind of customer to a high level kind of customer, which uh, is actually the core of our customer base. Uh, next slide, please. And um, on this slide, I'm actually underscoring the Union of Technology and uh, Services, which I actually spoke about a bit earlier. So you find that our system is referred to as smart because it is premised around a digital platform that is able to provide smart applications that enable us to give clean, affordable and reliable energy, uh, as well as additional energy services for our customers. So you notice that um, with uh, our solution, there are various uh, higher end uh, services that are put into play and of course we come with a good network of partners that are able to help us support and prioritize economic growth, human development and environmental sustainability as you can see on the right of uh, the presentation. Next slide please. 
So uh, here I'm focusing on uh, Zambia and of course our one pilot mini grid which is in the eastern region of Zambia. Of course uh, this is a 28.35 uh, kilowatt PV peak uh, uh, generation but I think I was speaking to uh, what Ibrahim mentioned earlier is that this is no longer sufficient almost two years down the line because you can actually see that there are capacity constraints because uh, energy tends to actually pour around a lot of people who actually gravitate towards where the electricity provision is. So to date, we have uh, 154 customer connections. Of course, this ranges with uh, 24 income generating activity hubs, five large productive users, three public institutions which comprise of the school and a rural health center whose uh, services have been able to be improved in terms of uh, their access to the electrification. Um, additionally, also um, is uh, the implementation of modern electric cooking since uh, July 2020. We've been able to see 30 households or respondents being able to cook with uh, 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 electric pressure cookers. So it's projects such as these ones that help to demystify what uh, alternative renewable energy projects such as uh, solar can actually do. So in transition to, um, we actually want to add an addition of uh, 29 more electric pressure users who should be able to benefit from cooking from a clean source of uh, electricity. Um, another good uh, highlight that we have is uh, a good HSSE track record and uh, no high potential events that have been recorded since uh, the operation of the mini grid in 2019. Um, I also spoke about um, having been in the market. So this has helped us to establish key partnerships and synergies, which is uh, the value add that we get into, into whichever village that we get into, because our projects are long-term in nature. And of course, we come with this band of partners and synergies that help us to provide a comprehensive solution that still prioritizes economic growth, human development, and environmental sustainability. So uh, you can notice the pictures uh, that I've attached there, which show the modern electric cooking. We can see an improvement in the ICT skills and also teaching at uh, uh, education level. We can see some of the productive usages uh, that uh, uh, I spoke about as having five large productive usages and also the impact also on the health center where we can see uh, there's a gravitation of uh, employees coming to work in this area because they feel it's an area that they can live in and uh, they're, they're able to provide a better service. Next slide, please. Um, for NG mini grids, uh, I have listed down what we noted as uh, key enablers for our business model. So number one is obviously to continue our operations with uh, the mini grids that we have and of course guarantee operational reliability which should be able to provide a proper proof of concept so that we can be able to scale up and actually revise our approaches for better implementation. Uh, a core aspect that we've noticed in most rural markets is the unavailability of access to consumer finance and appliance financing, which uh, we obviously want to undertake under our commercial units where we sell efficient and affordable appliances on this to own to be able to actually revo revolutionize uh, the kind of customer base that we have so that we can move from a tier one kind of customer to tier two, tier three, tier four, tier five kind of customers. Then uh, we also want to focus on developing productive usages because we believe this is the anchor load that uh, is quite significant in the village, which helps to eliminate aspects of uh, seasonality and also helps to create local jobs and also additional service provision, uh, which is necessary to in unlock the productive potential of uh, these rural economies. And of course, with all of these things, there's a lot of learning to be done and we obviously want to develop a lot of new services that should be able to uh, make our business model much more viable. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, please feel free to get in touch with me directly or also engage uh, with us uh, at the uh, provided website there. Thank you, Dorothea, over to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much, Muka. This was really amazing. Um, so you have very strong connection with the local people. And uh, let's come back to this later in the panel discussion. But we, 
before we are coming to the panel discussion, I like to ask Mrs. Hearn, Mrs. Hearn uh, something. Uh, the Green People's Energy uh, in association with the Alliance for Rural Electrification is going to organize a series titled Paving the Way for a Clean Energy Transition with Decentralized Renewable Energy. What, in your opinion, is the basic idea behind this series and what are the potential outcomes you are expecting? Just a short um, information about that, Mrs. Mm -hmm. Nguyen. Yeah, thank you so much. Yes, um, so as I told you in my presentation, that we would like to scale up because we have a lot of good ideas uh, and now it's the time to scale up. And um, um, and that's why we would like to make this uh, webinars because we can bring people together with uh, different good ideas and different good examples and then learn from each other. That's something like networking. As I told you from our financial situation, we would like to scale up and that's the same. We would like to scale up, for example, with uh, good good examples and and which in which countries it's a good situation and so learn from each other. Maybe um, some have some barriers or sometimes have some obstacles and how can they change, for example, the market regulation. Um, from Mrs. Um, Mutanuka, I uh, noticed that there is an um, electric pressure uh, cooker. And, and that, I think, is very, very interesting because a lot of uh, companies have the problem of um, deforestation and so they need alternatives. And we were talking about um, more efficient stoves, but they need a wood too. So if you have a special electric um, situation, it could be better. So um, that's a good exchange of good ideas and then we can transport these good ideas to other countries. Um, even that is uh, this uh, webinar and this uh, presentation is one of a good exchange of good examples and we would like to make it in the future. Make it more very concrete, not, not with what will we do, but very con concrete examples uh, why are they working good? What are the mistakes? What do we have to avoid? And for example, productive use, um, uh, Ibrahim to something of um, uh, very good productive use examples. So we can, for example, um, uh, we have a lot of uh, diesel generators and when we um, replace them by photovoltaic solutions, that is, um, in some years you have your investment back, and all these ideas you can bring in those webinars, and then we can scale scale the solutions up. That's the idea. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Tune, for the explanation. Um, then this is also a good chance, if we maybe cannot answer all your questions, you may send us via chat because of time constraints. Um, there's a possibility that we can take them up in one um, of our events in this series. So, um, yeah, that's very good then. And uh, so let's start with a with a panel discussion. And um, you all, in all your contribution um, from different angles, of course, you emphasize uh, the importance of excess of affordable, reliable, sustainable and modern energy and this is in line with the um, sustainable energy goals uh, 7 um, the SDG 7 so less than 9 years are left to achieve the SDGs which calls for accelerated efforts and in your opinion how clean energy technologies can help to ensure the achievement of the SDGs. So, who like to start? Who like to open? Who like to make the first ice-breaking sentence? Maybe, maybe it's okay. Yes. Yeah. So, Ibrahim, yeah, I mean, we we can list. You have a very uh, bad connectivity. Maybe you can move your, uh, really? your your equipment a little bit. Maybe that's better. Okay. Is it better okay. now? 
Is it yes, Adam? Yes, that's it. Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. Adam. Okay. Uh, yeah, I see that uh, the, the energy is uh, uh, energy is a tool. It is an essential tool for uh, any kind of uh, any for the SDG or development, economic development. So I think uh, is uh, extremely important for 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 um, you know uh, energy workers. You know that. Uh, uh, it could really consider, you know, to go on um, communities and also when we talk about, uh, uh, you know, empowerment and uh, make community more resilient to climate change, the impact, so that to really provide energy because you have a kind of uh, possibility to make more value additions and uh, also more uh, kind of uh, transformation possibilities, jobs, and uh, income generation and diversification of economy. So I think that is why the, you know, today very, very essential for, for, for energy access when you talk about economic yes. development and empowerment. Thank you. Who would like to, to add, Mrs. Sen? Yes, uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, my experience from all the trips I made to Africa, I can see if you have electricity, you can make a lot with, for example, productive use. Electricity is not only one of the sustainable development goals, it is an instrument to achieve uh, two-thirds of the other sustainable development goals too. So, for example, if you can um, cool the fish, it's very important uh, for, for, the, uh, for the fishermen because um, they have um, more income with that. If you can dry the fruits, uh, it's good. If you maybe have an e-car that you can uh, load with the electricity of the solar system, you can bring your harvest to to the market, um, and then you have more income for a longer time. Um, You have a lot of um, craftsman activities. Uh, As I said, if you have a diesel it's it's um generator it's very very expensive and uh, if you can use it with solar it's even better um so you um can um have more income you have more jobs um and especially in industrial countries maybe in my country with without any electricity we wouldn't have our wealth, we wouldn't have our lifestyle, we would uh, have nothing. So electricity, energy is the basis of uh, economy, it's the basis of um, better living con- uh, conditions of, of the women. And as I said, um, I would like to strengthen um, women because if we have more electricity in the schools, if we have a better water situation, the young girls and can go to the school, they can learn something, they can be educated, they need um, less ways to go for, for firewood, they, there is um, less danger for them, uh, so they can develop in a better way, um, or we have a better water situation. So most of this uh, sustainable development goals we can achieve better with energy. And uh, so it's so important to bring energy, especially to rural areas, not only to cities, but also to rural areas, because in rural areas, we have a lot of big families, a lot of young people who have no perspective. So they are all going to the cities and then living in very poor situations. And if you can give them an, a perspective in rural areas, maybe some of them will stay there. We have the same situation in, in Germany. Uh, we had really rural areas where nobody would like to, to live because the young people w- would like to go to the cities. And when we um, invested in renewable energies, these rural areas, they had more income, more tax income, better um, living situation, and, and now it's a better situation for them because they are producing electricity now. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Schoen. Uh, Muka, you are working directly with the communities. Uh, your view on this? You can. Yes, indeed. 
Yes, indeed. Thank you, Dorothy. And uh, in that context, I really want to echo Mrs. Hornwitz, where she speaks about energy being a catalyst to be able to uh, to actually achieve at least two thirds of uh, the SDGs. So you understand that uh, we do have a timeline in terms of achievement of these SDGs. And when we speak about decentralized renewable energy, it shows a level of importance that we should be actually giving it because immediately you introduce uh, energy or electricity, you can see efficiencies coming, smart uh, uh, metering coming, digital applications coming in, entrepreneurial activities, and also um, just uh, something that speaks to the environment, which we should all be concerned about. So really, uh, um, in speaking to the communities, yes, we want to engage them in the planning to actually see what is it really that uh, matters to, the, to them so that this decentralized renewable energy solution should actually speak to the issues and problems that they have for electricity to have a lot of meaning to them. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So, um, Jens, you also... Uh, you like I mean, I think most of it has, has been said. I fully agree with the, the viewpoints before as, as that um, yeah, decentralized renewables are also the least cost solution. So it's not just, quote unquote, it's not just a matter of, of um, uh, let's say, a, a social agenda, but it's also pure economics. From a business point of view, it also makes sense to go for decentralized renewables. Uh, so that's one thing. And in, in terms of the socioeconomic catalyst that both Muka and um, Ms. Hearn referred to, fully agree. I think there were some figures from IRENA that showed that 4.5 million jobs can be created directly from the decentralized renewable energy sector. So that's jobs uh, for operators, installers, system designers, and so on. And in addition to that, there are all the derived jobs in related industries that benefit from the electricity. Um, I think a powerful report showed that that was five to 10 times more than uh, the 4.5 million jobs. So it's really um, a tremendous catalyst of job creation in rural uh, economies that we're looking at here. Uh, and with the right support, that can really be a, a game changer uh, in the long run and in, 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 the, in the green recovery. Also, in, indeed, as Muka said, um, the, let's say, technologies, the renewable energy technologies and accompanying te technologies have also improved tremendously. Uh, so that's not um, only the solar, uh, uh, hydro, bioenergy technologies, but also the, uh, let's say, monitoring technologies, remote uh, monitoring, for example, has helped a lot with the efficiency of systems. There's also improvement in the battery technologies, which improves the lifetime and efficiency of the systems. In the site assessment tools, um, so better, uh, better equipping developers to estimate demand which has been a major problem in the past in, in, um, in projects to, to match demand, um, mm -hmm. or match the, the supply of electricity with the demand. So there are really improvements in all levels. And what that boils down to is essentially that uh, decentralized renewables are the, the best and least cost solution for the majority of people. And also the one that creates, um, luckily, the the biggest uh, so socioeconomic benefits. Yeah, so we all agree that energy access is very important, but now the COVID-19 pandemic has been driven us around for over a year now. And um, uh, you will know it also from your work. And so COVID-19 turned out to be a giant roadblocker towards achieving energy access milestones. So, uh, which you will have also experience in your work, I guess. And the latest estimation by the international energy agencies showed that unless the efforts for financing and recovery are accelerated, an estimated 630 million people will still be in the dark in 2030 in Africa. What, in your opinion, can be done to prevent this? So I... Uh, in your contributions, you um, had this topic with COVID already, but um, what kind of solution will be there to uh, get it running with the SDG 7? Um, who like to start? 
Ibrahim, you are still with us or? No, maybe not. Yes, I, I'm here, but I don't know how is my condition now. Yeah, it's, it's really yeah. unstable, but you can try. And if it's get to worse, then we will switch to the next speaker. So, but please start. Okay. Uh, yes, I think, uh, you know, the, 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 the situation with the, the COVID and uh, in our uh, business is that uh, as a new, we, we have uh, uh, in Africa, especially when it comes at least to Mali and the side countries. So the activities uh, continues uh, more or less normal. And uh, of course, many of our activities are related also, especially when it comes to our banks. Most of banks in our environment are related to the international bank. So we, we, can, we saw that there was some kind of a, a slowdown at that level. Uh, but when also to some of the restrictions at the national level, it was not so big restriction like we so saw in, uh, you know, we were never locked down in, um, in, 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 at least in Mali and the side countries. Uh, we, we, what we, what you can learn, I think the most important is what to learn. Uh, what we learn from the COVID and it means that the, the local economy and the small economy are extremely important. And uh, so it is it's very, very important to have the possibilities, you know, for the communities to, to, to be able to produce and to have a wide instrument, which is energy, and to process locally, and then also to generate. And also it's very important during the COVID, we can learn that the digitalization, I was, it was in my slide, so to be able to digitalize all the operation systems. So that has been very helpful. And it's one of the things that we are working very hard at access and also supporting all the organization in Mali. We need to digitalize. And it come, you know, in this moment, like we are talking now with, uh, with this uh, webinar, and then also on uh, have this card that we monitor all our mini grid and we can our our client can do all the payment from the house with money. Uh, so we 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 see that this is extremely important, useful. It makes our partners, our investors more secure, and uh, it also allows you know to provide more services. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ibrahim. So, thank you, Ibrahim. We are going to losing you again. Yeah, thank. thank yeah, thank you so much. Maybe okay. Muka can take over and uh, maybe uh, add something. Or how is the situation in Zambia? Is it the same? Maybe you can pick up some some issues. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dorothea. Of course, we cannot ignore the added complexity that uh, COVID has presented in terms of uh, doing business. But then again, I think uh, as humans, naturally, we are quite adaptive. And I think uh, that is the case even for the decentralized uh, renewable energy, considering one is nascent and um, we are quite uh, uh, faced with uh, a lot of challenges and risks. And I think uh, what COVID has presented is uh, quite a learning, which uh, has uh, implored upon us to actually have a more robust use of uh, digital applications that actually instill a much better service in terms of uh, real-time uh, provision of uh, different services, information, and also how we engage and interact with uh, various customers. And then again, um, Things related to the lockdown really restrict a lot of movement, which uh, is a turnkey or a shift in terms of uh, thinking mechanism, uh, which should push us towards uh, a much more self-reliance. Uh, so this is a message that we've been trying to send across to our customers where we're pushing for much more value addition, which uh, is uh, incentivizing higher or additional services, which uh, do provide service to the local community and uh, surrounding ones. I think um, I can leave it at that. Yeah, okay. Thank you so much. So um, I think um, COVID-19 is now, um, we will see it everywhere. We will get in contact with this issue in all of our um, 
uh, daily life um, parts. Uh, so also the politics uh, will play uh, a essential role, but uh, not only in this case, but also in other fields. So I would like to um, to come to Mrs. Thurin as a former minister. You have extensive know-how on the subject. Based on that experience, uh, you like to tell us about the framework conditions a country uh, may follow to define and implement appropriate clean energy politics. Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, first I would like uh, some ideas for in, in the COVID-19 pandemic yeah. situation. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I think when, when we noticed last year in summer that um, we have re really a critical situation, especially for a small and medium-sized um, companies in developing countries uh, who are engaged in the energy market. Um, uh, for decentralized energies, um, we had the idea from the ministry to have a small fund um, and give some subsidies for these companies uh, because uh, we had a um, we asked um, the companies in the countries, uh, we um, we had some GIZ um, uh, offices and uh, noticed that some of the companies said, when we have only a credit of about uh, 5,000 euro, it's enough to help us um, to overcome the crisis in a better time. Otherwise, we would like, we have to shut down our shop here and so um, we will uh, lose a lot of knowledge. So we could help a lot of companies with a very, with this very small fund. And um, um, because it was very important to have this small and medium sized companies in the market and not lose them. Because if we would like to lose them in this um, COVID crisis, um, all the knowledge will spread away and uh, we have to build it up again after the pandemic. That was the first one. The other, we had some uh, projects in our uh, Green People's Energy project, um, for example, for hospitals, um, because they need for vaccines, they need more cooling systems, and so they need a, a better um, installation in the hospitals. And on the other side, we had some uh, projects to um, produce some materials that is used in, in the pandemic, you know, masks and something like that. And we can do that, uh, for example, with the help of, of um, electricity. And the other is that some of the um, uh, countries, um, they were in the investing money, um, recover, recovery packages um, to help the economy. And um, we um, gave some example from some countries who are invested this money, especially in renewable energies, because um, we could uh, show that if you are investing this recovery packages, especially in renewable energies, it is more resilient than other uh, investments uh, you you can do. Um, that was three examples how we can manage uh, the pandemic uh, crisis, but um, it's really, really a bad situation. The other question was, what's about uh, frameworks? We notice in Germany that framework is one of the main keys to support renewables. For example, in Germany, it was a Renewable Energy Source Act that gave every person in Germany the possibility to invest in renewables. There's no risk because I could go to the bank and look for a credit and set the security of uh, 20 years um, to get their money back. Um, that was the key for the success in Germany. Um, you can't transfer this solution to other countries, but what I saw in Africa, that were some obstacles. For example, some countries decided to say, yes, if there is a household, who is only um, a consumer of only some kilowatt hours, you know, a small consumer. And this consumer, because of social issues, um, is, um, don't have to pay more than 
five dollar cent per kilowatt hour, you know, because it's a poor household and that is a social issue. But for example, that is one country in Ghana. Ghana is one country, and but some others in in this region, Elma, Kotowa, uh, and so that's something going in the same direction. But if you have such a policy, you can't look for solutions in rural areas because you can't invest in a in a system in rural areas um, for five dollar uh, cent per kilowatt hour. Um, I think better is to to look for the solution. What are the, the people now paying in the villages? They are now paying something for diesel, they are paying something for kerosene, they are paying something for candles and petroleum, you know, and and put all this together and then say we can make another solution for that. Uh, but it, um, we need um, the legislation uh, that we can do it, you know, mm-hmm. and then, for example, the people in these villages they they would say yes we are we can pay uh, not uh, five uh, dollar cent per kilowatt hour maybe we can pay thirty or forty dollar cent per kilowatt hour because it's a better situation than we had in the past or we are um, it's um, we would like to do that you know because uh, we have a benefit of it and and so make it a bit more free uh, um, not so restrictions that there's no possibility to invest in rural areas. Yeah. Um, and then there are some other barriers, um, but um, maybe we can come, come to other questions. <laughs> yeah, because we are running out of time, so we have to to shorten our, our answers a little bit. Um, so, Muka, in Zambia, what is the situation? Uh, NG Power Corner, has uh, electrified 13 villages and 150 businesses and communities infrastructures. So what were the main policy and regulation, regulatory challenges you faced during uh, your electrification work? So, okay, thank you very much. So um, thank you for noting the 13 mini grids that are operational and those are operational in two countries. So uh, you notice that um, regulation and policy frameworks will vary from country to country. And of course, um, as we get into different geographies, we are quite concerned, first of all, about the existence of regulation and if it exists, the structure that it takes. Um, I think Ms. Fiona actually spoke about uh, the structure of uh, regulation in terms of uh, tariffs. Um, is, is the developer quite free enough to set their own tariffs? I mean, these are some of the blocking points that we've had in certain markets. And of course, uh, uh, engagement with uh, various industry platforms uh, and also associations such as the RA, uh, institutions such as the European Union that are quite active in the energy sector have really helped to get uh, the information across of what the practice is in reality from a policy perspective and also just giving an overview of uh, a developer's overview in terms of what that means in business context. So I think there's been a lot of um, grassroots and uh, high level engagement to actually get across those learnings, return of experience and those points that have actually helped to shape uh, what um, regulation looks like right now. It's not at its best, but we believe with uh, all these engagements, it could be better. Okay, thank you very much, Muka. So, Jens, the regulatory framework is also important for the private sector as well as for the financial sector. So, um, ARA is one of the most influential entities uh, representing the voice of private sector in the decentralized renewable energy industry. Access to finance remains a grave challenge that the sector is facing. So what steps ARA is taking towards catalyzing uh, investment in the DRE sector? Can you give us a very short question? Because I also have another question in the chat, which I would like to come to. And we are running out of time. I guess we have only six more minutes left. Um, So please, Jens. Yeah, I'll, I'll try my best to boil down a very <laughs> large question to a very short answer. I think to those who listened to the uh, high-level uh, panel a few days back, my colleague David also um, 
made a longer answer to this question. So I'll take the building blocks of that. Um, so the first building block is uh, the amount of finance needed in the sector. We need to scale that up massively. Um, several investment reports have shown that it's really only a fraction of investments that go in the decentralized renewable energy sector rather than the utility scale one. So it's all about uh, the proportion of money that goes in and using that money to crowd in private investments because no um, public money alone can can um, put in enough investment uh, or investment of the scale needed uh, to reach the SDG 7. So that's the first thing is the amount of money. Um, the second thing is that these uh, financial instruments need to be tailored to the market. Uh, so the, the way the instruments need to be shaped need to take into account that we're looking at uh, smaller sizes of projects. Um, typically, a lot of investors uh, look at bigger projects, which is a problem because um, then the, the threshold is too high uh, for, for the smaller decentralized renewable energy projects. So that's the second thing, the tailoring of the instruments. Um, and the third thing, um, and which is related to the answer before from uh, Ms. Mutanuka as well, is, is the regulatory framework for these investments. So they are both the general investment frameworks for doing business um, in the country, which is, uh, well, let's say um, applies to any business investment in the, in the country. And then there's the specific uh, decentralized renewable energy and mini grid rules, for example. For the mini grid rules, um, well, basically, the, the government is the one that determines the, the essential uh, core rules of the, of the game. So they um, need to have establish a role for the private sector, and that needs to be transparent and clear. And in the mini grid policy guide I alluded to before, we have set out a, a series of choices the government can make uh, and how the consequences of those will play in into the market development. So it's not to say necessarily that it needs to be all private sector driven or all government driven. Um, but if you take X choice, then there will be a Y consequence and outline those those choices for the governments. Um, yeah. Last point, uh, and uh, I'll be very quick, is, is on the, let's say, enabling environment in general to catalyze the market. Um, so there's uh, building on the policy element, there's also the need to foster business partnerships, develop the capacity of the local <laughs> job force to uh, maintain the systems and so on. And I think in that field uh, as well, uh, uh, plays a critical role. And we're also very happy now to be uh, collaborating with um, GPE among other uh, partners in that segment. So that's uh, really a, a super <laughs> short version <laughs> of, very of short quite version. a big, big yeah. Um, question, but yeah. Uh, yes. get, feel free to get in touch uh, with me if you would like to discuss uh, this further or, or partner with Aaron. Yes, this is, uh, thank you very much, Jens. Uh, yeah, um, so we have a lot of uh, other questions and a large number of questions um, we have to deal with. Um, shows us how important this issue is and how great the interest is. But unfortunately, due to time constraints, we cannot respond to all of our questions and your questions. And uh, um, however, your questions will not get lost. As we mentioned before, there will be a series of um, different events. So at this point, I would like to point out that the um, upcoming events uh, of the series paving the way for uh, cleaning uh, for clean energy transition with uh, decentralized renewable energies, uh, which we will have together with uh, the Alliance for Rural Electrification, we will announce it on our um, through our GIZ networks and also to our homepage, and as well as ARE will announce it through their networks as well. And if possible, we will feed in your questions in one of our next events of the series. And before I invite Mr. Deepak Mohapatra for the closing remarks, I like to thank all of you, especially Mrs. Bärbel Höhn, Mrs. Mukabanya Matakunaku, uh, Mr. Ibrahim uh, Togola and Mr. Jens Jäger. And of course, uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention and uh, for interacting with us via chat. So please, Deepak, 
it's your turn. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dorothea. I wish that we had a whole day to talk and on, get on with the discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a definitely a, a good step forward to have the chance to put the decentralized renewable energy topic in this high level EU Africa business forum. As we all know, COVID-19 has put a reset button to the whole world, disrupting the development and the proceedings by, um, and at every fund. So today we witnessed an inspirational keynote speech by Mrs. Hearn, who outlined the importance of decentralized renewable energy contribution to the energy systems and how essential they are um, to scale up with the development of the sector to achieve clean energy transition. Mr. Yeager went on to reiterate the words of Mrs. Hearn and presented the work of the Alliance in the sector, aiding the private sector to expand on many fronts for providing access to energy. Interventions from the ARE members Access and NG exemplified, exemplified these words with their on-ground work and experiences in Mali and Zambia, respectively. Well, the ARE sector has many things to offer, and the, the, in that regard, we can they reiterate a couple of points like productive use and sector coupling as highlighted by Mrs. Hearn. Applications can range from fo uh, fo uh, the food and farmers produce processing, cold storage, e-mobility, access to water, healthcare, education, and whatnot. What we mean to portray here is that this series is just an effort to make the four important things possible in the way forward of achieving clean energy transition. As our CEO, Mr. David Lecoq, said during the high-level forum, it requires leadership, innovation, cooperation, and finance, and with a fresh approach characterized by voluntarism and optimism. And these are the two ingredients both Europe and Africa together have in abundance. The panel discussion was pretty engaging, and I was very happy with the kind of discussion, and I'm pretty sure the audience feel the same. So... Before closing, I would like to make a last call to all the audience who are active in the decentralized renewable energy sector to get in touch with GBE to learn more about the initiative and also to get in touch with ARE to find out how we can assist you with various range of services ranging across business development, policy and advocacy, marketing and communication. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. And we will see you again in the next event of this series, Paving Way, uh, for the clean energy transition with decentralized renewable energy. Until then, stay safe and go decentralized. Thank you.